Thank you. Um, as I understand my charge today, it's to tell you a little bit about what sociologists of social movements know about social movements uh, that might help you as you begin to forge a movement for public health and, and health equity. Um, I know you're going to be talking a lot about what the goals of this movement should be. Should you be seeking changes in federal policy? Should you be seeking to raise public consciousness, uh, to press the healthcare industry for more preventative care? And I'd like to put my two cents in about goals before I begin to give you a kind of primer on social movements, which is that um, the history of social movements suggests that movements are well served by having multiple goals, uh, or better, by having a fairly vague or capacious set of goals, and then working on multiple targets at the same time, the let a hundred flowers bloom strategy. Now, of course, the advantage of focusing just on a single goal, say, changing federal policy, uh, is that you are able to concentrate resources, resources of money, time, energy, and so on. But I'd argue that there are also advantages to having multiple goals. One, that you can recruit uh, more varied and more participants and supporters. Um, two, that you can achieve more in the way of successes. Movements never achieve all their goals. And the more targets you have, the more likely you are to achieve some of your goals. And third, working on multiple fronts opens the possibility that you can capitalize on those different fronts. We know, for example, that litigation plays a powerful role in consciousness raising. Right, that consciousness raising can help in legislative efforts. Uh, so I'm going to argue for multiple goals as you, as you continue your discussion or launch your discussion of what this social movement should be. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about what we know or what we think we know about social movements. And I should mention that there's debate over every single one of the points I'm going to make today. So, so feel free to challenge me as we talk about it uh, further. We typically, though, dis define a social movement as an organized effort to change laws, policies, or practices by people who don't have the power to affect change through conventional channels. So the assumption here is that it's easier to make change by having your lobbying groups speak to congressional representatives. But traditionally, the people who are launching social movements don't have that kind of access. And we say an effort to change laws, policies, or practices to emphasize the point that while movements often target the government and try to get legislation, there are a range of other kinds of challenges that movements make to policies, to institutional practices, to beliefs, uh, to every way of, everyday ways of behaving. The single most important insight of social movement research over the last 40 years, I would say, is that movements don't come out of nowhere. Uh, Rosa Parks was not a middle-aged woman who was just too tired to stand on the bus one day. Uh, in fact, she was a longtime activist, was secretary of her state NAACP organization. In the popular imagination, we tend to think about social movements as these kind of groundswells of volcanic discontent emerging out of nowhere. And what we know from the study of actual movements is that that is rarely the case. In most cases, there are groups of activists who've been fighting for the cause for many, many years. There were uh, African-American individuals and organizations who were fighting for political and economic enfranchisement long before the Montgomery bus boycott. There were people for fighting for gay and lesbian rights against nuclear power long before people had even heard of those terms. So the question then that social movement scholars have posed themselves is not when do 
movements emerge sort of out of the blue. But when are these stalwarts, these people who have been quietly under the radar fighting for the cause for years, when do they gain the leverage to actually mobilize something larger? And to answer that question, uh, scholars have typically focused on three ingredients for mobilization. I'm going to talk about these very briefly. Uh, political opportunities mobilizing structures and resonant frames, kind of jargony terms, but I hope I'll be able to make clear what they mean. So political opportunities are typically defined as changes in the political environment that make the government newly open to challengers' claims. Okay, I'm going to talk about the government, but I think it's important to remember that movements are not only targeting the government. So what kinds of things change in the political system that make people in power potentially um, amenable to challengers' claims? And so. Um, Scholars talk about a variety of things, cleavages within the ruling uh, elite or regime that make parties eager for votes, new legislation, policies, or rulings that signal the government's openness to challengers' claims. For example, uh, and that can be something like rhetoric. For example, President Obama's speech yesterday about inequality and the importance of minimizing disparities in income. That social movement with scholars would say represents uh, a political opportunity. Allies within or around the government who can be petitioned, who can be brought into the movement. And I'll talk in a moment about the blurry line between who's an insider and who's an outsider in social mobilization. And finally, threats. Um, it can be natural threats. Three Mile Island uh, provided a kind of political opportunity for the anti-nuclear movement. Uh, threats can be legislation. Uh, the Supreme Court ruling in Bowers versus Hardwick stimulated, in a certain sense, the gay and lesbian movement because that ruling was seen as such a threat uh, to their rights. I want to talk for a moment about what kinds of political opportunities there might be out there for a movement uh, seeking an enlarged notion of public health. And realize I know very little about the Affordable Care Act. I only know what I read in the New York Times. So these are just to throw out some possibilities to give you a sense of the kinds of things that social movement scholars, when they talk about um, political opportunities. So as you know, the Affordable Care Act is focused primarily on uh, health care reform. It doesn't talk much about public health. But I think a social movement scholar would say that the passage and implementation of the act does open up political opportunities for mobilizing around these issues that are not centered on medical care, that are broader than medical care. One, extraordinary media coverage of the passage and impl implementation of the act. My colleague Edwin Amenta did a study of uh, 100 years of newspaper coverage of major social movement organizations and found that move, movement organizations tended to receive most coverage not when they were out in the streets demonstrating, not when they were marching, but after the passage of legislation when movement organizations commented about what the new legislation meant. So there's opportunity there for groups promoting public health to make arguments in the press like the fact that the Affordable Care Act doesn't go far enough, like the fact that preventative care could provide the kind of cost savings that people are increasingly focused on. Now, you can ask, well, you know, so what? You get an op-ed in the New York Times saying that uh, public health is not just about access to health care. Does that really matter? And what the research suggests is that it does matter. We bemoan the fact that no one reads the newspaper anymore, but the fact is that the media and the mainstream media does continue to set the terms of public debate. 
And the media and even newspapers are what policymakers continue to read. So media coverage does, our research suggests, remain important. Two other possibilities. One, sympathetic bureaucrats. When the Social Security Act was passed in 1935, it mandated the creation of state agencies who, that were, that were um, directed to target a variety of issues, blindness, unemployment, uh, old age, poor children. The old age movement targeted these agencies and managed to get the concerns of the elderly put to the top of their agenda. So it suggests that a movement can draw on the help of, can enlist bureaucrats, people who are in these organizations created by the government, created as the result of new legislation, to press their case. Uh, in the case of the Affordable Care Act, one thinks of the state exchanges, which have been talked about as a kind of opportunity for experimentation. Uh, Vermont in particular. So is it possible that the people who are running these exchanges could be enlisted uh, to sign on to this larger agenda? And finally, mobilizable allies. When legislation is passed, and certainly this is true in this case, there are a lot of organizations who organized around uh, the legislations. I'm, legislation, I'm thinking of the AARP, the major unions, and so on. These are groups that have had the agenda, uh, the issue of health care on their agenda. Might they be pushed further? It seems sort of odd to say this, but social movement scholars only recently began to recognize the fact that many social movements target not the state, but institutions outside the state. Think about the movement to ordain women in the Catholic Church. Think about uh, movements for curricular reform in schools and in universities. And so the question that we've begun to ask ourselves is, well, are there things like political opportunities when it comes to challenging, when it comes to changing practices that are outside the state? Right? Then it, when it comes to changing the practices of the healthcare industry, or of medical schools, or of other institutions. And I want to suggest that we also see opportunities possibly in the fact that the healthcare industry is, as you know, increasingly consumer oriented and increasingly brand conscious. Um, with respect to the first, a kind of interesting example is the movement for alternative medicines, uh, which initially made very little headway with medical schools, but actually found a much more sympathetic ear among insurance companies, right, who at that time were adopting a more kind of consumer-oriented focus. With respect to brand consciousness, a number of studies have shown that corporations today are truly responsive to uh, issues that affect their reputations. And so one study of corporate boycotts found that the corporations were likely to change uh, their practices in response to the boycott, not because of the threat of loss of revenue, but because of the threat to their reputation, to their image. And so we have several examples of movements that have sought to make changes in corporate practices that have been effective. For example, at a time when the federal government was not especially uh, focused on gay and lesbian rights, gay and lesbian activists were able to secure partner benefits from a number of corporations. And the way they did that was by arguing that this would put these corporations, these businesses, on the kind of cutting edge of progress. Second factor uh, that, that uh, scholars talk about is mobilizing structures, basically how you get people mobilized uh, for a social movement. And the insight here is that people rarely join movements on their own. 
Uh, if you remember that movie Network, when that crazy anchor person suddenly said, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore, and he stood up and yelled that, and then people in their living rooms across the country said, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore, and a movement was born, it doesn't happen that way. Right? <laughs> Even if you believe in a cause, it doesn't make rational sense to participate. It makes more sense to free ride. After all, if the movement wins, you're still going to enjoy the benefits. So the kind of challenge for movements and the challenge for movement scholars is how do people get people to participate rather than free ride? And the answer, of course, is that people participate because they feel compelled to, right? Because they feel that if they don't do it, no one else will. Well, how does that happen? And what the research shows is that most people are brought into movements by pre-existing structures, churches for the Southern Civil Rights Movement. Uh, breast cancer support groups for the breast cancer movement, that people are brought into movements by friends, by people they respect, uh, and that that's what leads them uh, to participate. Now, I think a key question, and one that we haven't really answered is, well, what about the internet? Right? The internet makes it really easy to participate. Right? If participation means signing a petition, right, and all you have to do is click a button, you've basically solved the free rider problem. So, part, so the internet makes participation easy, in some ways makes those pre-existing mobilizing networks unimportant. The obvious question is, does internet protest actually change anything? Um, I think it can. I can talk more about that uh, later, but I think that's a kind of live question. Marshall Gans is going to talk much more about, I think, the structure of movements and leadership in movements, and I just want to make two points uh, based on the research on social movements. One is that the most effective movements seem to be hybrids of grassroots participation and elite participation. For a long time, social movement scholars believed that the action really came from the people who were giving money to social movements. Uh, later, the pendulum swung the other way, and social movement scholars argued, no, the action really is in the grassroots participation, the pr people who bring their resources of time, energy, and commitment. And what we believe now is that it has to be a combination of both. Uh, that grassroots participants are crucial to movements, but at the same time, elites have contacts, have political and economic capital. In fact, I think we're going one step further, which is to say the line that we often draw between outsiders, social movements, and insiders, political officials, corporate CEOs, that that line is increasingly blurred that people within government have been critical allies in social movements. People in corporations have sometimes taken the lead in pressing for changes. So I think we need to think much more about the ways in which elites and grassroots participation can work together uh, effectively. The second point I want to make is about coalitions. Um, Coalitions, you probably all know much more about coalition work than I do. Coalitions are critical. What the research suggests, though, is a kind of challenge, which is that it makes strategic sense to enter coalitions, and when the coalition isn't wor working for you, it makes strategic sense to leave the coalition. But the research also suggests that people tend to form coalitions and tend to work well in coalitions with people they like people they feel comfortable with. One of the kind of obstacles to coalitions between the environmental movement uh, and the labor movement was that these groups operated in separate spheres. And so it was very difficult for them to kind of forge the personal relationships that are essential to coalitions. So what I would argue that this really makes a case for, one, brokers, 
for people who can make people in different movements and in different organizations feel comfortable working together. And it also suggests that coalitions should be thought of in this kind of dual way as strategic, but also as relying on a certain level of personal comfort. Uh, finally, I want to talk about uh, resonant frames, the movement's message. Uh, to mobilize participants, to garner media coverage, to enlist support, to delegitimize antagonists, uh, movement groups must generate a persuasive message. And what we found, I don't think, will be terrifically surprising to you. Uh, one, effective frames are diagnostic, prognostic, and motivational, meaning uh, they explain the problem, they provide a solution, and they issue a call to arms. They're mobilizing. Frames that don't seem to work are the ones that say, this problem is terrible, right? There's nothing we can do about it. Or, this problem is terrible, and we know the solution, and we're going to take care of it on our own. Right? There's, there see, it seems that there have to be those three components. The second um, conclusion is that effective frames appeal to dominant values, equality, cost effectiveness, and personal responsibility. Those are some of the kinds of values that we see as, as hegemonic, as powerful in American society. And I want to make two points here. Um, one is that equality continues to be a resonant value in American society. We often sort of wring our hands about how it's so hard to fight for equality and, and equality is often trumped by arguments for, for personal freedom. The Pew Research Center found that 90% of Americans believe that the government should do everything it can to ensure equality of opportunity. 90% of Americans. Now, of course, you can debate what actually counts as equality of opportunity. But I do want to emphasize the point that equality continues to be a resonant value. Um, the other thing that I would say, and, and this is something that is debated in the literature, but I believe that movements are effective when they rely on multiple frames. So in the example that I'm thinking of here, and these, these pictures come from the movement against the death penalty. The death penal, death, anti-death penalty advocates seem to have made progress and, and have secured support both from progressive groups and conservative groups um, by making a variety of arguments, some of which seem a little bit inconsistent. So they've argued that the death penalty violates the sanctity of human life. They argue that the death penalty is often administered in, in inequitable ways. They've argued that the death penalty is too expensive. They've argued that the death penalty isn't an effective uh, deterrent. Now, Again, some of these arguments might seem to be inconsistent. If the death penalty violates the sanctity of human life, then the cost savings shouldn't matter. But it seems as if the movement is able to be effective by making both those arguments. And I think what explains that is that people hear the arguments that resonate with them, and they ignore the other arguments. Right? So if I'm someone who's not especially religious, then the notion that, that the death penalty violates the sanctity of human life won't really speak to me, but I'll hear something else in that message. And so one of the questions that I've been wrestling with in my own work is just how important is kind of consistency in messages. We often hear pundits from Washington saying, you've got to have a single message. You've got to have a simple message. You've got to stay on message. And I think some of the research suggests that, in fact, you may gain more in the way of support and coverage by having multiple messages that speak to different groups. Uh, the last point I want to make uh, and I, and I raise this kind of as a, as a question, as a challenge. It's something that I struggle with. 
The work on framing seems to suggest that successful frames pit a protagonist against an antagonist. In other words, it's hard to mobilize without an enemy. Now, certainly we do have examples of movements that have done that, right? Movements like uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, movements for um, anti-littering, as Mildred pointed out, that we sometimes call consensus movements. They seem to have won ground without spurring as much opposition as something like the Civil Rights Movement, the Women's Movement, the Movement for the Affordable Care Act, and so on. So we do have examples of those movements, but the question is how often they can actually be effective. Um, Bill McKibben, who is the sort of father of the climate change movement. He wrote the first book about global warming. And he's recently argued that the problem with the global warming, the anti-global warming movement is that he says it, it, it's failed basically because it has been restyled a kind of lifestyle movement. So we all recycle our cans, maybe we drive Priuses, but the bottom line is that developed nations are not limiting their, their CO2 emissions. And so I think for a movement focused on public health, you kind of have a, a, a similar dilemma, which is that if you don't have an enemy, if you don't have an antagonist, then does the movement risk being styled a kind of lifestyle movement, right? So we need all to watch our weight. We need all to exercise, right? Those things are important, but you don't want that to be the sum total of the movement. And so the challenge I would pose is how do you identify an antagonist, identify something we're fighting against without thereby alienating potential allies. I think that's the, the strategic dilemma. Um, I'm going to stop there and look forward to continuing the discussion. Thank you.